good afternoon everyone just a few things thank you sir just a few things at the top and then i'll get right to your questions uh, first let me start with a brief update on the status of the joint logistics over the shore capability or jlots that we're establishing in support of humanitarian assistance efforts with usaid and other partners as my colleague sabrina singh briefed on tuesday the construction of the two portions of the JLOTS system, both the floating pier and the Trident Pier or Causeway, have been completed and are currently positioned offshore at the port of Ashdod awaiting final movement. While I'm not going to provide a specific date, we expect these temporary piers to be put into position in the very near future, pending suitable security and weather conditions. In the meantime, the motor vessel Sagamore departed Cyprus today loaded with humanitarian aid for transloading onto the motor vessel Roy P. Benavidez, which is currently off the coast of Ashdod, to begin the process of staging humanitarian aid. And once the floating pier and the Trident Pier are in position, this will allow for the Benavidez to transload the aid to logistics support vessels and delivery while the motor vessel Sagamore is back in Cyprus to enable loading of additional aid. And as you are aware, this is a complex operation which requires close coordination with many partners. The United States is joining an international community-backed effort led by USAID with support from the United Nations, the World Food Program, the Republic of Cyprus, other partner nations, and the IDF to expand the delivery of humanitarian assistance via a maritime corridor to the people of Gaza. We're grateful for the continued partnership and cooperation of all involved in this important effort, and we'll be sure to keep you updated as the JLOT system becomes operational. Switching gears, Secretary Austin hosted German Federal Minister of Defense Boris Pistorius today here in the Pentagon for a bilateral meeting to discuss ongoing efforts to support Ukraine in their fight against Russian aggression. The two leaders also exchanged views on the upcoming 75th anniversary NATO Washington Summit in July and address broader security issues to include challenges in the Indo-Pacific region and our nation's mutual commitment to global stability and NATO's strategic goals. A full readout from the meeting will be posted to the DOD website later today. Following his meeting with Minister Pistorius, Secretary Austin departed the Pentagon to travel to South Carolina, where he'll deliver the commencement address at South Carolina State University tomorrow. He'll also visit Fort Jackson to meet with troops, swear in some of our newest recruits joining the U.S. military, and see the Army's future soldier preparatory course. And finally, after joining NATO last year, Finland forged a new tie with the Department of Defense when they signed their formal state partnership agreement with the Virginia National Guard at a ceremony in Helsinki on May 2nd. While only recently formalized, the partnership between Finland and the Virginia Guard goes back to 2001, when the 29th Infantry Division of the Virginia Army Guard deployed with Finnish Defense Forces as part of Stabilization Force 10 in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The National Guard State Partnership Program now includes 89 partnerships with 106 nations around the globe. And I would encourage you to reach out to National Guard Bureau for more information. With that, I'm happy to take your questions. We'll start off with Associated Press, Tara. Thanks, General Ryder. Um, first on Rafa and then a second topic. Uh, the President yesterday said that depending on what happens in Rafa, he may also pause potentially artillery and weapons shipments to Israel. Uh, and a senior administration official um, said earlier this week that JDM kits were possibly under consideration as something else that might be paused. Can you give us an update on the shipments? The one, the 2,000 pound and 500 pound bombs that are already paused and whether the Pentagon has received any requests to pause additional weapon shipments. Yeah, first, um, you know, let me, let me just say up front, Tara, that as you heard both Secretary Austin and the President say, our commitment to Israel's uh, inherent right to self-defense remains ironclad. And as you know, we've provided billions of dollars in security assistance to Israel. Uh, we've supported their efforts to defend themselves uh, most recently, Iran's unprecedented attack. So there should be no question that we will continue to stand by Israel when it comes to their defense. Uh, also, as Secretary Austin and the President highlighted yesterday, we're currently reviewing some near-term security assistance. Uh, specifically, we paused one shipment of weapons consisting of 1,800 2,000-pound bombs 
and 1,700 500 pound bombs. Uh, we've not made a final determination on how to proceed with the shipment, uh, and uh, you know, not going to get into hypotheticals. Um, again, we've been very clear on our views as it relates to uh, Rafa and any ground operations there, uh, and I'll just leave it there. What would um I guess determine your final decision on whether to send weapons. What do you need from Israel in order to send them weapons, or to determine that you're not sending weapons? Yeah, I'm not, again, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Uh, as I mentioned, we've we have uh, paused one shipment, um, and of course, we're continuing to discuss with Israeli officials, um, you know, their plans as it relates to Rafa and addressing the Hamas threat. Okay, and on a separate topic, on Friday, a Florida uh, sheriff's deputy shot and killed senior airman Roger Fortson. He was in his own off-base apartment. Um, the, sh the deputy entered the apartment, shot and killed him. Has Secretary Austin been following this? Is he concerned at all? Has he reached out to the family? And are there any kind of greater concerns about all the military personnel that live in off-base housing when you have law enforcement coming and responding to a call? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the secretary is uh, following this closely, uh, and, and I would like to offer our thoughts and prayers to Airman Fortson's mm -hmm. family. Uh, we are, of course, saddened uh, at the loss of one of our own. Uh, I know that his death is currently under investigation, so I'll, I'll have to refer you to the Florida Civil Authorities for any questions about what happened. Um, but we do know uh, that his family is grieving, and we offer our sincere condolences. Has the secretary reached out to the family? That's my knowledge. Uh, I can tell. Uh, Pat, a little more detail on the pier. You said the Sagamore is underway. It'll load on to the Benavides, and then the Benavides will load on to smaller ships. Is that? Can you? Yeah. So the way to think of this, Tom. Sure. The way to think of this is um, in this period of time that we have before the pier becomes operational, we're we're essentially using that time uh, to get ahead. And uh, since the Sagamore has been loaded uh, with humanitarian assistance, by transloading that onto the Benavides, uh, the Benavides is essentially in position to immediately start loading that onto the floating pier for subsequent shipment to the causeway and delivery to the shore. Since the Benavides will be on the scene, so to speak, uh, the day we pull the trigger and, and start operations, that then frees up the Sagamore to go back to Cyprus to load up with additional aid. And then once this process gets going, uh, the way to think of this is you'll have that floating pier several miles offshore. Uh, ships will go directly from Cyprus to the floating pier to, to unload. But because uh, we're again uh, waiting for the appropriate security and weather conditions to kick this off, we're going to use that time to our advantage to move forward. So the Benavides will unload onto the pier itself? Correct. And then do we know who will be driving the trucks along the causeway to the beach? So there will be uh, non-U.S. civilian contractors uh, that will be uh, driving those vehicles on the causeway onto the beach. Okay. Bill. Oh, real quick on the on the Benavides and all that, is that is that going to be the regular rhythm for you all, or is that just what you're going to do to prime the pump? And That's just prime the pump, right. So, yeah. Yeah, so it. essentially after that, what will happen is uh, the floating pier will be available for vessels to dock at, to transload onto the logistic support field uh, uh, vessels. And so, um, you know, it, it could be the Benavides, it could be the Sagamore, it could be other ships, again, that are picking up aid in Cyprus and bringing it to that floating pier. And then on, uh, on, on uh, the, the pause and, and some munitions, um, you know, could, could you explain a little bit about, you know, why those munitions were paused? And, and give us a sense, if you could, if, if Israel's trying to attack, uh, you know, underground uh, uh, facilities used by Hamas, um, why those wouldn't be appropriate for, for that mission? Well, again, um, you know, as we assess the situation in Rafa, um, we made the decision to pause this one shipment. Uh, again, as I highlighted, a final determine, determination has not been made on how to proceed with that shipment. But specifically, uh, we're focused on the end use, uh, especially rather focused on the end use of the 2,000 pound bombs and the impact that they could have in a dense urban setting as we've seen in, in other parts of Gaza. So uh, that's something that we'll continue to look at. Now again, uh, looking at the broader context of the U.S.-Israel relationship, as I highlighted, we are going to continue to support Israel and its defensive needs in terms of um, 
the capabilities they need to defend himself. So uh, again, we're talking about one shipment uh, consisting of those 2,000 pounds and 500 pound bones. Thanks. Hey, Pat, just quickly on the 2,000 pound bones, can you say the last time there was a shipment of, of the 2,000 pound bombs to Israel? Uh, I, I don't have that information to provide, Tom. Thank you, General. Uh, so yesterday the President acknowledged that Palestinian civilians have been killed um, by U.S. provided weapons. Uh, do you have a number of how many or assessment of how many civilians were killed by these weapons and does the Secretary feel any moral obligation to kind of make that assessment? Um, I, I don't have a, a number, Fadi. Uh, again, as we've said from the beginning, uh, the loss of any innocent lives in this conflict are tragic. Uh, we've been very clear from the start uh, with our Israeli partners uh, that we expect that they will employ any capabilities we provide them in accordance with the law of armed conflict uh, and international humanitarian law. And that has been a consistent uh, and um, uh, steady conversation that we've had from with them from the beginning and it continues to, to now uh, so again as they contemplate uh, how they will approach Hamas and Raf and Rafa uh, we uh, certainly have provided our thoughts and how to best do that to take civilian safety and humanitarian assistance into account and we'll continue to have those conversations you're talking about expectations however as you just mentioned before that one of the consideration about the 2,000 pound bombs is uh, the density of the population in Rafah and how they were used before in other location by, by Israel. Why didn't you restrict before the use of these bombs knowing that Gaza is one of the most densely populated areas uh, in the world? And were you expecting something different? Was it a mistake not to restrict the use of these bombs in Gaza? Well, you know, look, a couple things. First of all, again, we've been very consistent from the beginning uh, in terms of how we uh, believe that Israel should approach addressing the threat of Hamas, uh, about the importance of precision in going after Hamas. And we've also been very clear that more needs to be done to ensure the safety and security of civilians, innocent civilians in Gaza. Um, you know, and, and I, I don't have to tell you, again, the, the challenging uh, environment here uh, with an adversary that, again, embeds itself amongst the civilian population. That said, we absolutely do not want to see innocent lives lost in this tragic conflict. So again, we're going to continue to consult with Israel uh, as they uh, look at how to address Hamas in Rafah, uh, and we will continue to do what we can uh, to not only ensure that uh, civilian safety is taken into account, but also look at how we can continue to, to get humanitarian assistance, whether it's by land, sea, or air, to help uh, the people of we Gaza. Uh, this is technical. Is there any interest in the Pentagon to look into how many civilians were killed by U.S. provided workers? You know, look, Fadi, right now there's a, uh, an ongoing conflict between Hamas and Israel, and we understand uh, the complex and dynamic nature of that conflict. So our focus right now is on getting humanitarian assistance into Gaza, also continuing to ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself. And again, I'd, I'd highlight just several weeks ago when they were attacked by Iran in an unpre unprecedented air attack. Uh, so those threats are real. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we're all working toward alongside many partners in the international community is a situation where Israelis and Palestinians can live next to one another in peace. There can be security and stability uh, in Gaza and the region. Uh, and again, we'll continue to work toward that. Let me go to Chris. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, just quick clarification. Um, on the uh, munitions, um, these are just purely the dumb bombs themselves, not any associated um, guidance kit that may come along with it. Yeah, Is thanks. Chris, I appreciate the question. I'm just not going to be able to get into more specifics on the, the package itself. Well, but I mean, presumably part of the issue is the nature of these weapons being unguided, causing damage. Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not going to get into the into more specifics. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know how um, these systems work, right? You, you have um, bombs, which are essentially dumb bombs which, that you put JDAM kits on, but as it relates to this particular shipment, I'm not going to get more specific uh, on, on the details of that beyond what I've already provided. Let me just go to the phone here real quick. Washington Post, Miss Ryan. Hey, Pat. Uh, thank you. 
I have a couple questions. Um, first of all, could you speak to um, the DOD assessment of what impact, if any, the pause in these particular um, weapons will have on Israel's ability to continue its campaign or the anything about what you guys think um, it, the impact will be, or maybe there will be no impact. And then I have another question. Yeah, so I, I appreciate the the question, Missy. I'm not going to get into assessing Israeli military operations and their readiness and potential impact on operations. Again, I think, um, as, as we've highlighted, uh, as we see uh, the operations um, being conducted in Rafah and as we assess those, the decision has been made to pause this, this one shipment. Uh, so I won't go beyond that. And your follow-up? Yeah, so my other question is um, related to what Kirby said earlier at his gaggle about how, you know, the United States is hoping that Israel doesn't launch a full-fledged offensive uh, into Rafah City, um, but that the U.S. will continue to work with Israel on other things, including um, sealing the border between Gaza and Egypt and also um, helping Israel target leaders, including Sinwar, that you know the U.S. is doing on an ongoing basis, he said. And so I'm just wondering if you could provide any more detail on those two um, activities, since they're military activities, like what exactly is happening vis-a-vis -vis, um, trying to make the border more secure and then um, on the targeting front, because it's a little bit confusing about the targeting, because I thought the U.S. was not providing targeting assistance. Yeah, thanks, Missy. Um, so uh, to be unfortunately unsatisfying, uh, I, I'm not going to have more details to provide other than, again, broadly speaking, um, we understand uh, and support Israel's right to defend itself. And of course, as, a, as an important partner and ally, we're going to continue to consult with them, uh, as we have been from the beginning, uh, on how best to do that. Um, but as it, as it relates to those specifics, I don't have anything to provide beyond what Mr. Kirby already passed along. Okay, let me go to uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Well, thank you. Uh, you had mentioned that the uh, incident in Florida is under investigation, but I'm just wondering, does the Defense Department have any advice or, or, or words uh, for airmen at Hurlburt who, who may be feeling pretty angry right now over this incident. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, again, um, you know, a tragic situation here. As I mentioned, uh, you know, we're certainly, um, you know, uh, saddened by the loss uh, of our airmen. You know, we, we obviously need to allow the investigation to run its course. Don't want to get ahead of that. Um, but, um, you know, we, we certainly never want to see our airmen or any military member uh, or any part of our DOD family uh, be put into a situation uh, like this. So, uh, again, we, we need to allow time for the investigation to run its course, and, uh, you know, we'll certainly have more to say um, once, once we've had the opportunity to see that. Thanks. Laura. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, hoping you could give us a DOD's assessment of Israel's campaign in Rafah right now. They've been doing airstrikes for weeks. My understanding is they evacuated 100,000 people from a certain area. Now they are bombing and on the ground in a certain part of Rafah. Can you say if that if that's generally generally correct? And does DOD assess that this is still a limited operation? Yeah, so uh, we do assess uh, at this stage that it is a limited operation. Uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm, I'm not in a position, nor would I provide an operational briefing on behalf of Israel. Um, but yes, it's uh, all indications are at this time that it is a uh, relatively limited operation meant to secure uh, that, that area. Uh, and so again, we'll continue to assess and monitor um, that's all I've got at this point. Has, have the Israelis briefed DOD on any additional plans to move further into Rafa or to expand the scope of the operation? Um, I don't have anything to pass along in that regard. Thank you, sir. Thank you, General. Uh, to what extent do you know that uh, Hamas is on board with the JLOT's plan? Is there direct communication between U.S. military leadership and Hamas leaders to make sure that they're not going to try to scuttle this. And then what happens if things go terribly wrong? 
on the beach front, is it Israel's responsibility or does the U.S. have contingency plans if Hamas were to attack the pier itself? Yeah, so to answer your question, no. Uh, no conversations between DOD and Hamas. Um, and, and again, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get into it intelligence other than to say uh, we have no intelligence at this point in time to indicate that Hamas is actively uh, targeting JLOTs or the humanitarian assistance. That said, look, this is a combat zone. It's a dangerous area. Um, and, and so um, we are going to continue to take security absolutely seriously. It's going to be a priority uh, for this operation. It has been a priority for this operation. And we'll do what we need to ensure that our forces are protected and those that are supporting this, this operation. Uh, and so, you know, to that point, I think as you see this go on, the commanders on the ground, uh, the commander, the U.S. commanders that are overseeing this out at, at sea and uh, from Israel, um, you know, they will have the authorities to make decisions as necessary based on the conditions as it relates to uh, any type of security situation. But all that to say right now, we would certainly hope that uh, if Hamas truly does care about the Palestinian people, that they would not threaten uh, humanitarian assistance being delivered to people in dire need. Uh, and for our part, we'll continue to work with the international community to rush that aid in. And who's responsible for the security of these non-U.S. civilian contractors on the ground that are going to be on the pier and on the beach? Uh, so as it relates to the, um, the security at the assembly area where aid comes off, of course, Israel will be providing security there um, and uh, working and coordinating with World Food Program uh, in order to, and, and others, USAID and others, uh, to, to provide that security on the ground. But again... <laughs> I uh, don't want to get into specific details on that for operation security reasons. Let me go to this gentleman. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up on the bombs. Do you have an assessment of how many of these heavy bombs that Israel already has? Like, do they already have a sustainable stockpile? Yeah, I just, I'm not going to get into the weapons inventory of a partner country. I'd, I'd refer you to them to talk about their okay, inventory. Just a quick follow-up on Rafa. Um, you mentioned... Sorry, Rafa, uh, sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. That's okay. <laughs> I can come back to you. All right, let me go to uh, Wafa from al -Hura. Thank you, General. Uh, General, can you please tell us what's your definition of a large-scale operation in Rafah, or what would the Pentagon consider acceptable in terms of the number of casualties uh, resulting of such operation? And I have another question. Yeah, thanks, Wafa. So, so look, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to uh, paint out hypothetical scenarios as it relates to Rafa. I think you have to take a step back and and look at what we're talking about here. You've got more than a million people condensed uh, into a relatively small area, uh, and uh, doing any type of large scale military operation within <coughs> the confines of that area present significant risks to the civilian population there. Uh, which has already been put in a very, very challenging situation. And, and so our focus has been on communicating with our Israeli partners on uh, the, the fact that we both agree that Hamas needs to be defeated uh, and that we understand that Hamas has elements within Rafah, but to, to do it in a way that takes the safety of civilians uh, into account as they conduct those operations. Uh, and so again, uh, as we have observed that this limited operation so far uh, in, in a portion of Rafa, uh, we're continuing to assess that uh, and, and in the meantime have paused that one shipment uh, of weapons. And then, I'm sorry, you had a follow-up? Yes. Uh, Mr. Kirby today talked about alternatives to defeat Hamas uh, uh, without the need for uh, the alternatives that do not require large-scale invasion. Uh, can you please talk a little bit about these alternatives? I'm I'm sorry, Wafi, you're coming a little bit broken. Uh, talk about what? what? Uh, alternatives to defeat Hamas that do not require large-scale invasion. Gotcha. Um, you know, so so look, um, w these are things that we've talked about uh, in the past in terms of sequencing, right? So the evacuation of civilians from the battle space to a degree uh, where you don't have the large 
um, you know, grouping of, of people that are, could potentially be impacted by this. Uh, it's ensuring that when you have evacuated those, uh, those people that they have access to food, water, sanitation, um, shelter, uh, and then, of course, approaching uh, the Hamas threat in a precise manner, you know, um, counterterrorism style, as you've seen uh, us and the Israelis do uh, elsewhere in the past. Uh, so th those are some examples. Okay, let me come back to the room here, Janie. Thank you, General. Two questions. Uh, South Korean President Yoon Suk Yeol said at the press conference yesterday that he would not provide lethal weapons to Ukraine. Does the United States still want 155 millimeter artillery cells and offensive weapons supports from South Korea? Well, look, I'll I'll let. Uh, the Republic of Korea speak for itself when it comes to what they feel comfortable with providing to support Ukraine. As you know, uh, the ROK are an incredible ally, uh, and they certainly uh, have provided uh, assistance, uh, non-lethal assistance to, to Ukraine, uh, and support the broader effort uh, to deter and prevent Russian aggression in Ukraine. But again, it's for them to talk about. We're just grateful for any nation uh, that can contribute in some way uh, to help send a clear signal to authoritarian regimes uh, that invading your democratic, peaceful neighbor is not acceptable behavior. <coughs> Thank well, Russia, uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense reported that Russia will conduct exercise on the use of tactical nuclear weapons. How can you predict possibility of cooperation between Russia and North Korea in the use of a tactical nuclear weapons? Well, look, you know, I talked about this before. Um, I've, I've seen that uh, reported in the press, uh, and I would just say, again, it's irresponsible, um, reckless, saber-rattling uh, that, is, that is dangerous uh, given the current climate, international security environment climate. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. Constantine. Thanks, Pat. Um, on senior Airman Fortson, um, can you say whether um, the, the Defense Department or the Air Force is assisting or uh, with the investigation? Uh, I'd have to refer you to the Air Force. Um, you know, again, the, as I understand it, the Florida civil authorities are, are investigating, but I'd refer you to the Air Force for any more questions on that. Eunice. Thank you very much, General. The fact that the president said that U.S. bombs were used to kill civilians in Gaza is pretty striking. Uh, does that mean that the, the Israeli military campaign has somehow made the United States complicit in, it, in any of that? Is that why uh, the Biden administration is now saying we don't want any part of that in Rafah? Is, is that <coughs> well, look, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the president. I think, we, again, we've been very clear from the beginning that after Israel was attacked by Hamas on October 7th, and again, I, I think it's important to remember that 1,200 people killed, over 250 hostages taken, half of whom are still being held. Uh, and it's important that no one forget that fact that Hamas is still holding these individuals hostage. Our focus has been on supporting Israel to defend itself from attacks by Hamas uh, and so that they can defend their people and, and prevent uh, another October 7 from happening. At the same time, as this conflict has progressed, uh, we've seen the unfortunate impact uh, that it's had on the civilian population in Gaza. And again, we've been very clear uh, that we do not want to see innocent civilians killed, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli. Uh, and so we've been working very closely with the international community to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We've been working to ensure that Israel has the ability to defend itself, but we also recognize the fact that more needs to be done to safeguard civilians in the battle space. And so, again, we'll continue to work toward that. I can walk, have one follow-up. If the president makes that determination that U.S. bombs are killing civilians anywhere, um, you know, any country that you supply those weapons to, does that determination come from the Department of Defense to the White House? And if so, what's the standard procedure with that said country? Yeah, again, I appreciate the question. I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. As you know, we have a process by which uh, we employ when it comes to evaluating the use of 
security assistance. And that process is currently ongoing. It's led by the State Department, so I'd refer you to them in that regard. Yes, sir. Thank you, General. Two quick question on uh, Syria, especially not this year. According to some local reports and local people, Iran is endeavoring to expand its influence in northeast Syria. And this is by using the local tribes, especially the Arab tribes, to establish some proxy groups with which they established in Iraq in northeast Syria. So is that something that concerns you or have you ever noticed this? And is there this is concerns you or has any raised eyebrows in Washington? Yeah, I mean, look, this is not new behavior for Iran. It's how they do business, right? So essentially by trying to train and influence proxy groups to essentially um, project their foreign policy of trying to expel the U.S. Uh, and other uh, partners from the region uh, in order to be able to do whatever it is they want to do unchecked. And so, of course, that's something that we continue to keep an eye on, um, you know, and, and I think it's important that from a U.S. perspective, you know, when it comes to the Middle East region, um, we respect the sovereignty of the countries that we work with, unlike some of these proxy groups which have embedded themselves uh, into the region. And when it comes to ungoverned spaces like Syria, uh, we're going to continue to stay focused number one, on the defeat ISIS mission, but we're also going to maintain awareness of broader uh, regional threats as we work with allies and partners uh, to, to keep an eye on it and, again, uh, to prevent potential um, you know, future situations whereby our forces, our citizens, or, you know, importantly, our allies and partners are threatened. Last question, as you spoke of the ISIS, uh, according to the security officials in North Syria, the ISIS activity has been increased in the past five months. And what one of the security officials said that the ISIS slowly, but surely growing stronger. And in the recent day, they killed a member of the SDF. So what's your assessment on that, especially on the ISIS activities? And how do you going to help the SDF to prevent the resurgence of the ISIS? Yeah, well, again, the international coalition uh, to defeat ISIS still exists today. Uh, and we continue to work closely with the international community to address the ISIS threat. As it relates to Iraq and Syria, uh, ISIS is by no means what it was 10 years ago, uh, and that's a good thing. That said, to your point, we can't uh, rest on our laurels and we need to continue to work together to prevent a resurgence of ISIS in that, uh, that region. You still have places like uh, al Hal, which contains you know, several thousand ISIS prisoners that need to be repatriated uh, back to uh, to their countries of origin. Uh, and so we continue to work with the international community on that front. When you look more broadly in terms of ISIS around the world in places like Africa or Afghanistan, you do see ISIS uh, starting to gain some traction. And so this will continue to be something that's very important from a counterterrorism standpoint and, and, and a threat we need to continue to take seriously. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, General. So two questions. One on Syria. Recently, U.S. expatriate like uh, some uh, prisoners from Al Hol camp. And uh, there are 11, I think, 11 people. And one is a non-U.S. Uh, citizen. So how does it come? I'm sorry, the 11 prisoners that yeah, from Al Hol camp, which are like uh, like ISIS members. Mm -hmm but U.S. expatriated them to the country. One is a non-U.S. citizen. Um, if I understand your cor uh, question correctly, uh, so essentially, yes. Uh, I mean, that is the goal, is to essentially uh, repatriate those individuals back to their countries of origin so that they can be, uh, it can be addressed in their own domestic legal systems uh, on how best to uh, you know, address that, that threat. Um, a, again, what you don't want is essentially a terrorist breeding ground where um, it essentially becomes a tinderbox waiting to explode. And so I know U.S. Central Command, uh, U.S. State Department has been working very closely with partners throughout the region, throughout the world to address this. Uh, and, and of course, working with the SDF from a, um, the, the forces that are actually running and maintaining that, that facility. One question on Rafael. You are working on building piers to provide humanitarian aid uh, into Gaza. 
And as you know, uh, Israel has controlled border gates uh, in Rafah. How has that made it difficult uh, to get aid into Gaza, into Rafah? Yeah, so, um, you know, broadly speaking, again, w- what you're seeing here, and, and, you know, another way to look at this pier is essentially as another gate into Rafah to get aid into. So, so in addition to working to make sure that there's an increase in flow of aid via land, um, it's also, we also have the opportunity via sea. And as you know, we've also been providing aid via air. Uh, so um, that's that's the way that we look at it. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, Pat, uh, Israel, I think, has done as much or more to secure non-combatants in Rafa as the U.S. has done in its own urban difficult urban battles in the past, going from Fallujah all the way back to the Battle of Manila in the Second World War. Is the U.S. holding Israel to a standard, an unreasonable standard that it has never really bothered to uh, to secure for itself? Yeah, thanks, Mike. So, yeah, so look, I'm going to uh, look at every situation based on its merits, based on the current operating environment. And, and the fact is, uh, we are where we are today. Uh, and I think we've been very clear both publicly and privately uh, that as Israel contemplates uh, its operations in Rafah, uh, that we would expect to see it be done in a way that takes civilian safety into account. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, the president and Secretary Austin have both said uh, that as we assess uh, what's happening in Rafah right now, we put a pause on this one shipment of weapons. Again, taking a step back, uh, to be clear, our commitment to Israel's defense will remain ironclad, and we will continue to ensure and take all necessary steps to ensure that Israel has what it needs to defend itself uh, from threats in the region to include Hamas. Yeah, October 7th, the president said that uh, he was behind Israel's plan to destroy Hamas. Is that still the case anymore, or is he sort of winding that back? We believe that uh, Hamas needs to be defeated, absolutely. Thank you. Jared. Just a quick point of clarification. On the Israeli military's relatively limited incursion in the vicinity of Rafah, um, I believe Israeli officials have said uh, that it's intended to cut off the flow of weapons to Hamas in that area. Uh, To what extent does this resemble the the initial move the IDF made here? To what extent does that resemble the, you know, the tailored operational plans that U.S. officials have discussed with their Israeli counterparts, or does this appear to be more consistent with shaping operations for larger scale ground clearing? Yeah, again, I'm not going to get into trying to characterize from the podium here um, detailed Israeli operations other than, again, what we've observed uh, and what they've told us in terms of it it being a, a limited operation. So. Last question, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, two questions, quick, please. One, conflicts around the globe still going on, one after another, and they are connected with military. Uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is still influenced uh, among global leaders. You think he has any power, any influence to stop and uh, end of these conflicts and wars going on? Are you asking me if Prime Minister Modi has influence to stop conflicts? Those the leaders uh, where the, these wars are going on, uh, like uh, Russia's and uh, Ukraine and in the Middle East and all that, his influence is uh, uh, more than ever today. Yeah, it, as uh, I appreciate the question, Gilfoy. As, uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, I'm, I'm not going to make a judgment uh, regarding the, the leader of India other than to say that, look, India is an important uh, and strategic <coughs> nation uh, and a very important part of the world. Uh, and from a U.S. standpoint, we, of course, very much appreciate the relationship that we have with India. And from a Defense Department standpoint, uh, look forward to continuing to bolster our security cooperation relationship. And Thank second, you. sir, yeah. uh, secretaries of uh, uh, state and uh, treasury were in, in, uh, in uh, China recently, and both uh, of them warned China in their own ways and different that not to influence uh, uh, elections or uh, 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 not to interfere in uh, U.S. Uh, interference in uh, many ways, including cyber and all. And my question is: Is this building DOD or Pentagon affected about or about those warnings to China uh, in any way, as far as the U.S. national security is concerned? 
Yeah, look, when it comes to uh, election security, uh, the Department of Defense, of course, plays a role in that, as you know. I won't get into the specifics of that other than it's something that we take very seriously uh, to ensure the integrity of our own elections to include on the on the cyber side. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.